So um, let's start with some prayer. Um, I would like one of you amazing peoples to start us off in prayer. Um, I see Joe. Joe said, yeah, it's my favorite chapter too. Obviously, we have great, great uh, taste in Bible chapters, Joe. <laughs> um, uh, let's see. Uh, well, it's got Larry can since uh, I, I'm going to be in and out and won't be able to participate too much, but I'm with you right now. Awesome. Appreciate it, brother. <laughs> Jesus, um, thank you so much for this, this day. Um, and I want to thank you first of all for this group and uh, for Grace and Skyler for starting it and, and the others, uh, OG members. Um, it, I really think it's like if Paul were here, he would be leading a group like Friends of Faith and he would be really excited about this. I think you're really excited about this. So please continue to um, grow this group and and let more groups let more groups grow through it and um, bless Kristen's beautiful children and uh lord um just open our eyes right now to romans 8 um lord if we just memorized this one chapter and applied everything in this chapter our lives would be good if we lost all the rest of the bible but had this one chapter life would be good and you've um, just absolutely flooded us with treasures in your word. And our lives are joyful to the extent that we take hold of them, apply them. Uh, I know I've failed to do that many times. And the times I have, life has been joyful beyond measure. Um, so bless everyone. Help us to work through the things that are, um, that are hurting us in the way that we're hurting ourselves and others. I'll help us to give all that to you and, and restore and renew and uh, Lord bless each one of my brothers and sisters here in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Joe. Beautiful prayer. Yeah, so glad um, to have you with us for a few minutes at least. Thank you. I'll be in and out. I'm getting ready. My, um, I can't see it, but lots of equipment to shoot a wedding in a couple hours um, with a camera shoot a wedding <laughs> thanks for that <laughs> key clarification <laughs> um uh Kristen, welcome good to have you hello i was I'm sorry i ruined your beautiful prayer i was getting hit with a bat from a trampoline i'm on the trampoline and he was hitting me with the bat underneath the trampoline so love you Joe. No, you didn't ruin it it's it reminds us of what's uh, beautiful in life i do yeah. god bless your kids yeah. Well, we're in Romans 8. We have not started yet, so you're on time. Yeah, you made it just okay. in time. We're going we're gonna to do the first half of Romans 8 today. Um, the only reason I came is because Skylar said that it's his favorite, and if it's fa Skylar's favorite, it needs to be mine. Well, we just discovered that it's Joe's favorite, too. So, I mean, it's, it's better be good. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't want to disappoint myself here. This is big. So. Yeah, it's, it's got to be. <laughs> All right, so... Uh, like I said, we're going to do verses uh, 1 through 17 today. Um, so what I'd like for us to do, I have, I have some questions for us to work through. We're going to read, we're going to read, the, read the passage. I want us to specifically have our eyes open for um, what some of you have probably heard us call identity verses. So these types of verses that like really, really powerfully speak to who you are, who we are, what we have. Um, you know, the kind of verses that you could, you could put in a, put on a billboard, you know, uh, you know, on a poster on your wall or, or have, you'd want to see on a neon billboard as you're driving down the road, you know, these, these powerful passages. And this, one of the reasons this is one of my favorite chapters and or it is my favorite chapter generally is a very popular chapter is because it has so many of those. Um, so keep an eye out for those. And then like, uh, at some point towards the end, we'll we'll kind of see what see if we can make a list of the identity verses that jump out at us. So um, we'll just split the uh, we'll split the this section up. Let's see if I could have uh, Gracie read verses uh, one through four. 
Um, who all has a Bible in front of them? Lisa, I see you have a Bible. Um, so Lisa, I'll have you read verses uh, five through eight. Um, I have one. Declan, do you yeah. have one on your tablet there? Yeah. It's the computer, but, you know, it's the Bible on that the works. computer. That works. It's the Bible on the computer. That works. Um, so then Declan, I'll have you do nine through um, 11. And then who else? Ben, did you say you have one? Yes. In fact, I have two and access the whole world, but I've all two on my computer. Awesome. And Ben, I'll have you, I'll have you cl uh, close with, with 12 through 17. Um, okay. All right, Tracy, I'll, feel I'll free start. to start us off. All right, verse one through four, Romans eight. I have the NIV. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind of sinful man is death, but the mind controlled by the spirit is life and peace. The sinful mind is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those controlled by the sinful nature cannot please God. I think it's me, right? Oh, okay, yeah. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God lives in you. And if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death, because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. So then, brethren, we are debtors, but not to the flesh. <coughs> Uh, to live a life ruled by the standards so that by the dictates of the flesh. For if you live according to the dictates of the flesh, you will surely die. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit you are habitually putting to death the evil deeds from prompted by the body, you shall really and genuinely live forever. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For the Spirit which you have now received is not a spirit of slavery to put you once more in bondage to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption in which we are cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself thus testifies together with our own spirit, assuring us that we are children of God. And if we are his children, then we are his heirs also, heirs of God and fellow heirs of Christ, sharing his inheritance with him. Only we must share his suffering if we are to share his glory. Brilliant. Thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, welcome, Chris. Great to have you, man. Um, okay. Wow. There's a lot here. There's a lot here. Uh, before I before I jump into into my first question, does anyone have an, an initial reaction or thought that they'd like to share? It's okay if you don't. Well, I'll, I'll just briefly say that when I I have read portions of this before, and of course it was one of those ones that I used to beat myself over the head with, because I because I related to the person who's living in the flesh, and I just thought, oh, well, I'm screwed, you know, because if if I was a Christian, I wouldn't be having all, you know 
all these desires that I that, that I have, you know, that kind of a thing. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things we're going to look at um, as we go through these, these first 17 verses, you know, is we're going to ask questions like, what is the flesh? And are we in it or not? Uh, do we have a choice? We're going to, we're going to sink our teeth into the meaty flesh of flesh. It's going to be exciting. So, um, okay, first question. Some of these are very like straightforward academic and others are more, you know, likely to foster a giant discussion. So first question uh, in verse one, why is the word therefore in Romans eight verse one? On the back to chapter seven and probably six and maybe probably five too, I don't know. Yeah, it points us back, exactly. Why? So why do you think Paul would want to point us back? Tracy? Well, he's been building a, he's been building a case for the past several chapters, which they're chapters to us, but when he wrote it, it was just a long letter. But like, he's been building this case that, you know, like, hey, you know, this is the way you used to be, but now you've been crucified with Christ. Um, when you were baptized, you're buried into his his death and risen with his resurrection. You're a new creation. You're no longer slaves to sin, blah, blah, blah. And so now like he's coming into like his grand, like ultimate conclusion in chapter eight, where he starts with, therefore, given all the things we talked about already, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And that's like that one sentence could be like the whole gospel message right there, the good news. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So for, for anyone perhaps that hasn't seen our commentaries and discussions on Romans 6 and Romans 7, uh, it's very easy to kind of truncate the Bible into these little, and we do it with verses and we do it with chapters. We sort of get these blinders on our eyes and we ignore context and we're like, oh, well, what does this verse say? Well, what does this chapter say? And, and I understand why we do that because we want to go deep into the meaning, but context is so important. And especially a word, with a word like therefore, the author is telling us like, hey, open your eyes and, and look at the context. So you guys are absolutely right. This points us back. And so we need to, we need to read everything that we're about to read as a follow on uh, conclusion, if you will, um, to what we've seen in the past couple of weeks. Um, so, therefore, there's no condemnation. So that's a that that's an awesome, powerful phrase. What does it mean, though? <laughs> what does it actually mean to not have condemnation? Lisa, we put Lisa. means I'm no longer beating myself up anymore. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Freedom. Declan, yeah. it's beautiful. Freedom. I know you've spoken of this before. Yeah, yeah, with the old lady. You have to, yeah. So, what if I do something wrong? Right? What if I stumble into a ditch, you know, do something that I, that I, I know is wrong, that I, I, I knew that it was wrong when I chose to do it, and then, and then I feel terrible about it? How does, what do I do in that scenario in light of Romans 8.1? Get yourself up. No more Jesus for you. Going straight to hell. It's a wrap. Sorry. Oh, wait, I just wanted to say, Skyla, I'm, glad, I'm glad you asked that specific question because that's the, that's really getting to the heart of the issue. That's the precise question that I've had trouble with. So, yeah. Well, you should probably just give up and decide that, you know, you're a filthy sinner and that you have no hope for the future and that you're always going to suck and that life is always going to suck and there's no hope for you, basically. <laughs> um sorry was that not what you were going for my bad <laughs> we're gonna need to we're gonna need to mute you gracie people are gonna start leaving by <laughs> <myself>. <laughs> um 
<laughs> no, but, but, but seriously, Skylar, that's what I used to think. You know, yeah, I too. screw up, I've messed up, I've, I'm not uh, taking my mind, I'm not renewing my mind, therefore I'm a stinking loser and, you know, it's just too hard, so blah, 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 blah. Now all I have to do is just come before Jesus and um, he takes care of it for me. It's already done. Well, for me, for me too, that's what Grace said. That's precisely how it was for me all the time. There wasn't any, you know, there wasn't any, you know, release from that. It was like, it was permanently like that. Right, right. So you guys brought up some, some fantastic things there. Um, Lisa, I love what you said. You know, I go to Jesus and, and he takes care of it for me. So can you, can you elaborate a little bit on perhaps the, the, the theological implications of what you mean by he takes care of it for me? For someone that maybe, maybe this is a new concept. Maybe there's people... Uh, lit, you know, watching this in the future, sometimes they're like, I don't get it. What do you mean by he takes care of it for you? Right. Well, he already died. He died once and that's enough. The old theology of the way I used to think was, is that I daily had to die to self. Every moment I had to die to self and it was exhausting. And that realization that uh, he already died for that. And um, I'm a new creature because he's been resurrected. And that's not me anymore. So what you're saying is that you believed the gospel. <laughs> yeah, and that the gospel set me free. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, exactly. And surprise, surprise, that's exactly what we read about in Romans 6, right? Which, if, you know... Again, if this is just one giant letter from Paul, which it is, then, you know, we'll flip a few pages back in the letter, a few paragraphs back in the letter, and it's where he's talking about how we were united with Christ in his, baptized into his death, and now we can walk in newness of life. And so um, everything that you're describing, Lisa, is, is absolutely biblical. It's absolutely biblical. Um, you know, and so I think... The issue of, of repentance, which is which is absolutely a thing, turning away from our sin, um, but repentance is often reduced to this notion that it, it's a it's just feeling bad. It's like feeling guilty, um, and like well, if you were if you really were sorry, you would feel terrible about it, and it's like I don't know that God is so interested in us feeling terrible as he's interested in us turning away from whatever the thing was and running to him, like running back to our father who loves us, you know, like the, the prodigal son's father, he wasn't like, you know, slapping on the wrist, slapping him on the wrist for blowing his inheritance. He was like welcoming him home. My son who was lost is found. And, you know, so in, in these moments where we stumble, and there's that temptation, that condemnation is waiting at the door to say, look what you did. Um, really important to remember that we were united with Christ in his death and that Jesus paid for it. And I think in both in Romans 6 and the, the study on Romans 7, we refer to 1 John because it so powerfully relates. I'm going to do it again real quick. You know, but Declan, to that, to that question, okay, I sinned badly, perhaps. What do I do, Right. What does First John? What does John say in, in First John two, one and two? He says, and "I'll read it again just so we can keep things moving." He says, "My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous." So again. If I could distill it down to one thing, and it's basically what Lisa said, when we sin, condemnation wants to point our eyes on us and say, look at what I did. Look, look at what you did. Do you have any idea what you've done? Right? But Lisa's saying, and John is saying, and Paul is saying, 
our eyes need to go to Jesus and who he is and what he's done. And in that place, condemnation has no voice because guess what? There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, in Christ. Tyler, can I, can I uh, add something? Please do. So, so you asked the question, um, so what do we do when we mess up? What do we do when we stumble or fall into sin? Like, how, what do we do? But like, how do we handle that, right? That, that was your question? Yeah, so like, I'll tell you what I used to do and what I do now. So I used to just like, most of us here, Lisa and Declan, like beat myself up a lot. Be like, oh, I can't believe I did this. I'm such a filthy sinner. Like, you know, that voice of condemnation telling me that I'm worthless, I'm trash. Like, you know, am I even saved? Because like the Bible says, if you walk with the spirit, you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And well, I just, desi- I just gratified the desires of the flesh. So do I even have the spirit? Am I even saved? Like, you know, like this whole spirally thinking, right? Like just so much condemnation, like this black cloud over you, right? Um, when that was before I used to, that was before that I knew that I was a new creation, that my old, my old nature was, was killed, cru- ugh, crucified with Christ right now when I fall into, when I stumble or fall into sin, like, which, you know, I still do on occasion. Um, it's not like I've, I never have like, since then or never will again. Um, it's been a lot less frequent. I'll say that, but like when I do, I don't beat myself up and ask like, okay, you know, myself like, oh, what's wrong with you? Why would you do this? Like, you're going straight to hell. Like, God doesn't love you. Are you even saved? Like, is the gospel even true? Like, instead I'll ask myself like, okay, like what lie was I believing uh, that caused me to, to go into this behavior, right? Because, you know, Romans 12 two says we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. So if, the, if my mind is not renewed in a certain area or I'm still believing lies or I, ha- I haven't like gotten a, a correct perspective, I'll often slip into uh, something sinful, toxic, or like, you know, unhealthy or whatever. Um, I shared this a couple weeks ago, but just like an, as an example, um, I, I told you guys how I used to like get really, really offended and really triggered um, by the stuff that I would see at school um, at BSSM because I didn't understand it. And like, you know, people were different from me and this wasn't how I was raised and this isn't, you know, what I'm used to and this isn't the culture I was growing up in. So like just constantly triggered, constantly offended by stuff I didn't understand. And then like realizing like, oh wait, like this is a temptation from the devil to make me feel this way, right? Like it's not actually like coming from within me because like, I don't wanna feel offended. I'm here to learn. I'm here to have an open mind. I'm here to like, you know, have intimacy with Jesus and have intimacy with community and people. So like, that was an area where I was like, okay like what lie am I believing? And the lie I was believing was that like, you know I don't like these people, I'm offended, I'm triggered. Um, You know, they're different from me so they have nothing to offer me. Does that make sense? So like when I fall into something now, I, I, I kind of take a second, sit back and be like, okay, like what lies am I believing? Um, I actually just had a conversation with someone the other day where there was a miscommunication and I got really hurt um, and I reacted like sensitively and got upset because I like, I, I chose to believe what, what they meant wasn't what they actually meant. Right. And then when we talked about it, like we realized, I realized that like, that's not what they actually meant. And I was like believing a lie, which caused me to react like upset and like angry. Does that make sense? So like the truth was that that's not what they meant at all, but like I was believing a lie. And so that led to a bad behavior. Anyways, I'm gonna stop talking, (laughs) but that's kind of an example of like before and now, if that makes sense. I just, uh, go ahead, Declan. Oh, but Gracie, I love I love it when you talk about these things because the same way as Skylar, you re- you really get to the heart of the issue, and 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 you use the same wording that would go in my, you know that I used myself in my own head. I mean, I I did question whether I was a, a Christian. I did question whether I was saved. As I, 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 quite frankly, I'll tell you the answer. I the answer I gave myself was no. I I obviously can't be. And no, I'm obviously not saved. That was the only explanation I could come up with for decades. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about. One one of the difficulties for me about the sin. So s- since I've been, you know, working with you guys, I found like that my occasion of 
doing sin seems to have lessened a lot. And also I've, what I've found is my relationship to it has completely changed. So it, it's not, I, I wish I could say to you it's been eradicated completely, you know, but I'm, I'm just being honest. I mean, there are some things I, I still do, but my relation, it, it's decreased. And also my relationship to it has changed where I don't, um, I, I don't get into like this pit of despair of feeling rejected and condemned. It just doesn't go there anymore, which is a wonderful thing. It's a wonderful thing, you know. What, what, one of the things I struggle with, though, is is um, so th th there's some sin I have where, where it, it, it's a repeat job. So what I'm saying is, see, if, if, I, if, if I gave up some sin and did a different sin tomorrow, it just feels better to me instead of doing the same one all the time. So, but but there's some sin that doesn't that I never do. Like there's, I never I never steal, I never gossip. I mean, I look at people that gossip. It's, what the hell is wrong with you? I mean, why, why would anyone do that? You know, you know. So I have my areas of, of sin, and what pisses me off is 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 that there's repeats of the same thing. So it's it's not like a, it's not like I do a, a different sin. It's the same one that I did yesterday, even though I said I wasn't going to do it. If that makes sense. Does that make any sense? And and then because it's the same thing. That I asked forgiveness for before, I, I still can end up feeling a little bit screwed, you know. Whereas if it was a completely different sin and it was the first time I was doing that, that that would be a whole different. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's a it's a really good question, Declan. Um, it's a really good question, and and it gets to the heart of hey, actually. Scholar, some... Yeah, go ahead, Kristen. Can I say Please something? Do. Please do. Um, my baby's kind of crying right now, so I'm going to try to work through it. Um, and I've, I've told Grace, you know, my whole life, or that, yeah, I've told Grace that, like, I really haven't ever had any issues with condemnation, right? Like, I don't, I don't ever feel condemned, and I actually reached out to her that, like, is something wrong? Am I doing something wrong? Then I don't feel condemned. Don't get me wrong. Like I feel guilty when I do something wrong, but it's not the point that I actually feel condemned that I'm going to go to hell or anything like that. Cause I like, basically how my mom raised me was, um, she said, think about it as like a parent way, you know, like nothing that you can do would ever make me hate you to the point that you're not my child. And, you know, I've just pretty much lived like that my whole life. Like, so my mom is here and she wants to say something, if that's okay. Say nothing. <laughs> yeah, <here we> <laughs> Hi. You're not on the video. You're just on the mouse. Hello, guys. Um, she put Hello. me on the spot. <laughs> so she just asked me why she didn't I, I she feel did. condemned mm -hmm. when she sinned. And I raised her as we were born into sin. So we can't get around it. So when Jesus died and gave us that that out, either accept it or not, you know, you you can you can he gave you the out. We cannot get away from sin. So what I took it as he God is our father. And if I had a loving father, as much as God ha is filled with love, okay. Now earthly fathers can't love at at the lengths of, of God our father but I have children there is nothing that my daughter could do that could make me hate her or make me turn my back on her I don't care how bad the sin is and I can't love my daughter one drop of blood more than than God the father loves me so i I don't take sin as, yes, I do ask for forgiveness. I have to. We are supposed to do that. But I can't be condemned by sin because I was born into it. And when Jesus died on the cross for me, I gave that up. And, and that's my opinion. But when I look at it as a, as a mother to a child or as a father to a child, and if you have children, you'll understand doesn't matter what they do I still love them with everything in me and I'm going to still try to guide my child the correct way so condemnation I think 
people take it to extreme when we want to try to get close to God. How do you try to get close to your mom after you've done her wrong? We're close to Mother's Day. Okay. I'm sorry. You know, please forgive me. Um, we all we all do our parents wrong. You know, we've all done that. So as God's love is more simple than we people will allow. It is that simple. If you're a parent, you can completely understand. If you're an, a, a parent of an adult child, you understand 1000% because these little babies don't understand sin yet, but these big babies do. So when them babies get bigger, <laughs> you'll understand where I'm coming from. There is nothing that my daughter can do for me to turn my back on her. Kristen, your mom and you sound so much alike. It's hard to know who's talking. Yeah, I was like, wait, is Kristen still talking? <laughs> no, that's that's Patty. Uh, Kristen, what's your mom's name? Patty. Patty. Uh, thanks for sharing that, Patty. Um, no, it's it's very true what you said. Like that, you know, as a parent, when a health a healthy love for a child is no matter what they do, you won't ever stop loving them. And that's the story with the prodigal son. You know. Uh, in the Bible. Um, and it's definitely condemnation isn't, it's obviously that's a, one of the tactics of the devil. He's the, he's the accuser of the brethren. He's the one that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. He's the voice of condemnation, not God. Um, so that's, that's all very true. Um, and it's a blessing, honestly, Kristen, that you didn't grow up with that intense cloud of condemnation that me, Lisa, Declan, and others were raised with because some people never get out of it. Some people carry that with them their whole lives. Um, now it's just important to not fall to the other side of the, of the spectrum because there's two ditches. Remember there's the legalistic, like feeling condemned every second. And then on the other side, there's the ditch of like, Oh, everything's fine. You know, God still loves me. He understands. And like the ditch of false grace, not saying that you are, I'm just saying like, just to be aware that there are two ditches, not just one, you know? So very happy for you that you did not grow up with like you know an intense no, no, black cloud of it. condemnation said, you know, over it's a, it's a super big blessing that i was raised the way i was but at the same time when i hear you know all of you guys talking about it i'm like am i doing something wrong <laughs> no well i don't think you're doing anything wrong kristen um i have a couple a couple responses and i would i would say this first of all um kind of foot stomp on this every every time we get together and that is you know my biggest heart as we do these studies is to look and see like well what does the text say what is the what is what are the words on the page say um in context balancing off of other scriptures etc um and uh, with regard to the condemnation thing um Paul describes in, in 2 Corinthians 3, he describes the first covenant, the, you know, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments. He uses the words, the ministry of condemnation to describe what, what that brought. Um, and I think the reason, the reason why many people feel condemnation and the reason why, in a sense, it was right when we were under the law to feel condemnation is because God is just, right? God isn't just the, uh, he isn't solely the, the cool, you know, everybody knows, you know, everybody, most of us probably had friends who had like the cool parents that just let them party and do whatever. And it was like, ah, oh, you know, we're leaving town for the weekend to have all your friends over and get drunk and do whatever you want. Nobody cares. Right. Like that's not the kind of parent that God is. Like, does he love us? Absolutely. <clears throat> does he hate us when we sin? No. But he does hate sin. That's the key distinction, is that sometimes when we mess up, we feel like, oh, God must hate me. Hmm. It's like, no, 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 he doesn't hate me. He hates sin. And because of the fact that he hates sin, he sent his son, right, to pay the price to free us from sin. So the condemnation thing, like it actually, actually derives from the just the justness of God, right? But the the enemy twists it to make it seem like, 
you know, well, if God is just, then he must hate you because you messed up. And we have to be able to, to recognize that and say, no, 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 no. Like, yes, God is just, but because he's just, he hates sin, which is why he freed me from it. He and why does he hate power. sin? Because he's holy. Ain't, and because well, sin yeah. hurt, hurts because sin hurts his children right i was like he loves us so much the reason he hates sin is because what it does to us in our lives and how it separates us from him right it's not just like this arbitrary like don't do that don't do this here's my rules it's like why does he not want us to do certain same things because have how it hurts us and hurts our relationship so yeah 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 so really good i'm really i really appreciate uh kristen you and your mom bringing that up because that's that's, it's important um okay here we are an hour in and we've completed one question on my list. <laughs> we've done verse one. Great job, everyone. Um, <laughs> okay. We'll, verse we'll keep two. it moving, sorry. We'll keep it. No, 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 this is great. This is what it's supposed to be. Like, I don't care if we follow my outline. Like, it's a great conversation. Uh, what does it mean to be free from the law of sin and death? We've kind of hit on aspects of this, but could someone just give a summary, like in their own words? What does it mean to be free from the law of sin and death? You are free from the law of sin and death, right? Yeah. Just check it. No? I mean, I'll go. I just don't want to be the one talking all the time. I want someone else to go. In case that sounds weird to anyone, by the way, verse two, quick reminder. The law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. So... Now, you, if you didn't know before, now you know. Free from the law of sin and death. Great news. You're welcome. <laughs> Johanna, what do you think about that? C can you hear me? I'm not sure whether you actually can because my internet is just so bad. We can. Your, your can you? Right I now. also can't see you. It's really, really bad. We, we, we can, can see you, you and hear you. Okay, perfect. Well, I remember that we were talking about this last week already um, and that we were talking when you're free of sin, it's kind of like being pure. Um, but like, for example, it, I mean, it relates to what Grace just said, right? That um, it's just very beneficial and for your own sake, right? I remember, for example, this one time when Grace and I started being friends, we were talking about, um, so I asked Grace, why is it actually that you're not supposed to sleep with someone before you're married? Um, why does that make sense? Because I didn't understand. And she was explaining it to me why it was considered bad it was not because God doesn't want us to have pleasure or anything. It's because he wants us to not be hurt and um, to do us good. And I think that that's actually relating to to being free of the law of sin for example if that makes sense yeah that's good johanna yeah, that, that's a that's a great example it's a great yeah, example because the, uh freedom and slavery get turned upside down sometimes um you know people will will think that when when the, when the church, when Christianity comes along and says, you know, hey, it's not good to have sex before you're married, people say, people feel like you're putting these rules on them and that they can't be free. And it's like, you don't understand what freedom actually is, right? Like, yeah, exactly. Because feeling... like, as someone who who didn't know I thought it was rather a limitation rather than actual freedom you know because I didn't understand until I thought about it from that perspective and it makes so much sense because it's just to protect us from anything that's bad for us and I think that's a really changing experience for literally anything that's considered sin or like because you know sin is not a limitation in that way it's not that we shouldn't do it to limit ourselves but rather to set ourselves free actually i think yeah that's perfect and i don't know who was here last week or johanna if you left early before you heard this part it's like mm -hmm. it's like the sign on the beach that says no swimming shark and yeah. water. 
right? The sign is telling you, don't go swimming because there are sharks in the water. You're going to get eaten. And people could look at that and be like, this sign's trying to take away all my fun. I want to go swimming. I'm going to go on the beach. Like, screw the sign. Like, and that's how people look at like God's rules sometimes. And it's like, uh, I mean, you can go swimming if you want, but it's not going to go well for you. Like, you know, so it's the same thing with like, why, like that, that sign isn't actually limiting you. It's setting you free because if you go swim in the water, yeah. you're going to get eaten and die or get severely like, like might, might lose an arm and a leg. And that's not freedom. Like now your life is like completely wrecked. Right. And so sometimes setting boundaries actually keeps you free. Like if someone's an alcoholic and they're trying to not drink, a limitation or a boundary that they're going to put over their life is they're not going to go or walk into any bar, right? Because they know that if they do, they might get tempted and like start drinking again and then get a DUI or run into someone and kill them or whatever, right? So that limit or that boundary is actually keeping them living in freedom, right? So like we have to understand like boundaries like are there to protect you, not to like ruin your life. So yeah, you know, um, I used to experience uh, the Ten Commandments in a certain kind of way. So the, the way it would have been read in church is by someone very angry. Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. And it really, it, 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 was, it was frightening. You know, it was frightening. So years later to where I am now, I, I experience it in a whole different way. It's not so much thou shalt. It, it, it's more like someone saying to me, uh, listen, you know, the, 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 there's a list of behaviors here. And if, it, you know, if you practice these things, you, you'll, there are going to be consequences. You know, if, if, if you desire someone else's wife, there's going to be a consequence. If you steal from someone, there's gonna, the way we are, there's going to be consequences. So if, we, if, if, if you have... You know, if you abstain from doing these things, life will be a lot more, um, you know, straightforward for you and enjoyable. That's that's all it's saying. It's a very different thing from from all the the uh, something that you know, the pulpit. Thou shalt not. It, it, the, the Ten Commandments are actually doing me a favor. You know, it's not something thing that, that that's onerous for me to, for me to do those things. It's in my interest. You know. Yeah, very, very, very well said. I appreciate the, those points, guys. Um, okay, verse three and four. Verse three and four. Um, specifically, verse four. Uh, Gracie, what does your NIV say? Um, my ESV says the in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled. Is that pretty much what yours says? Yeah, mine says in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. Okay. The reason, if anyone's wondering, the reason why I often ask Gracie about her NIV is because NIV is probably the most common, like non-King James version in English. It's like one of the most widespread. So it, I often kind of refer back to that. NIV, ESV are, are two of the biggest ones. Um, and then obviously there's the King James as well. Um, so... <clears throat> What is that phrase, the righteous requirement of the law? That sounds very sort of legal, kind of judicial. So how is the righteous requirement of the law fulfilled in us? Notice it says it's fulfilled in us. How is it fulfilled in us? Take it away, Gracie. <laughs> oh, Lisa, are you trying to go? Well, was just, Jesus fulfilled it. For right, us. but it says it. Okay, all right. So, well, then why would it? Why would? Why would Paul say that it's that it's fulfilled in us though, and not say that fulfilled in Jesus for us? Well, can I take a stab? Yeah. I'm just, I'm just being silly, but yeah, go ahead. Well, like you said, God is just, right? Like a good judge can't be like, oh, you murdered someone? It's fine, you know, and let you go. Because then maybe people would be like, um, what the heck? That's not a good judge. Like even in like a earthly court, like you want a judge to like give, give what's due, right? 
Like, obviously, everyone wants to get off the hook for themselves, but if, like, a murderer comes to comes to trial and they get off the hook, everyone hates that, right? No one likes injustice, right? So God is just, and the wages of sin is death, right? The wages of sin is death. That's, I forget where that's in the Bible. It's somewhere. <laughs> um, gosh. So how it's fulfilled in us is, like, well, Jesus was crucified, right? But we were crucified with Christ. When we are baptized, we enter into his death, right? So our old nature did face the consequences of sin. Our old nature is dead, right? So like, and, and G, like, this is, this is, the, this is what's so good about the gospel. Like, like g he couldn't have made it any easier. Like literally salvation is the easiest, most painless thing possible. Like Jesus is like, okay, I love my kids. I don't want them to have to die. What can I do? It's like, okay, I'll pay the price for them. And then they can just agree with me and then they'll, they'll be fine. Like we don't, we don't actually have to die. Literally. We just believe in him and we are united with him spiritually so that we actually can like, pay the debt that we owe, but not actually have to like, like literally the gospel is like the best news and it makes salvation so easy. Like it couldn't be any more painless. So like, it's just mind blowing how like, easy it is sorry <laughs> no that's awesome and, and and i wasn't disagreeing with you lisa um I, you're, you're absolutely right i just i wanted to dial in a little bit further on that because <laughs> the way it's easy to kind of it's in roman six that we just did <laughs> yeah yeah uh, it's in the bible somewhere who knows could be anywhere <laughs> this sounds familiar like, didn't we just talk about this <laughs> <laughs> two weeks ago um <laughs> Yeah, but it, you know, these verses come alive when we realize, when we remember what we just looked at a couple, couple weeks ago. And so this notion of the, the righteous requirement of the law being satisfied in us, well, why is it satisfied in us? It's satisfied in us because, because we were united with Christ in his death and resurrection, right? So like this idea of, well, he did it, but I'm over here. Like, no, no, that's, that's like a false paradigm. There's no him over there, me over here anymore. It's it's me in him, crucified with him, raised with him. Like he satisfied it, which means it's satisfied in me because I'm in him. So union. union so it's almost like the Holy Spirit dwells in you and you're the temple of the Holy Spirit? It's, I mean, kind of, you know, in a manner of speaking. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, now we're getting on to the real meat and potatoes here, guys. This is big. Um, I'm a vegetarian. So well, I'm sorry. Um, solid food is for the mature. So Hebrews, here it comes, whether you like it or not. Um, all right. Verse five. Verse five. Um, Declan, could you read verse five one more time for us? Yep. In your in your best amazing voice. <laughs> Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. Brilliant. Brilliant. Okay. <clears throat> What is the flesh? Crickets. Uh, I, I mean, it, it, <laughs> it. I mean, there's a number of things that I that come to mind. The, the first thing that comes to mind is an area of sin for me where I, you, you know, I, 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 I mean. Quite frankly, I, I'll, I'll see an attractive woman, and, and, and it is about, you know, flesh. I, I mean, it's, 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 it's a weak area for me, and it, it is literally about flesh, you know. But then, but, but, but I look at it more broadly in the sense of it, maybe it's my propensity to, um, uh, to, to, to do those things, that, you know, that are out, maybe out, or sin, you know, that's outside the law or whatever my propensity to sin well okay so flesh can have two different meanings 
depending on what they're talking about in the Bible. Um, it can literally mean your physical body, like your flesh, right? Like, and your body is neutral. Like your, your body is not inherently bad or good. It's just an instrument. It's just a vessel, right? In the same way that a scalpel can be used by a doctor to save lives, it can also be used by a criminal to kill people, right? Like the scalpel itself isn't evil or good. It's who, who's using it, right? So when we offer ourselves as instruments of righteousness, we are righteous because we are in God's hand versus we can offer ourselves as instruments of wickedness and we are wicked when we are in the devil's hands, right? So like our physical bodies aren't evil, which there are some branches of Christianity that teach that anything, anything of the flesh is evil, right? And it's like, that doesn't make sense because God created the world and he made everything and said, it is very good, right? So like God wouldn't have created flesh and matter and it called it very good if it was inherently evil, right? So that's the first thing is flesh can literally be talking about your physical body. Um, the second meaning of flesh um, can be the Greek word is sarx, S-A-R-X, and that's specifically referring to the sinful state of human beings, like your, your, your sinful nature that you're born, that you're born into um, cause we were, cause we were under Adam, right? So this is, we have to, we have to like decide like which flesh they're talking about when we read the scripture, cause it, we can get confused. Like, are they talking about your physical body or are they talking about your sinful nature? Right. Because like our sinful, our physical bodies aren't evil, but we had a sinful nature and that's what was crucified with Christ, right? That that's what was put to death and that we have, that we don't have any more when you're a born again, new creation believer. Was that what you were asking? <laughs> yeah, no, it was. And and for anyone, again, I, and I, I multiple times say, like, for anyone who's watching, for anyone who sees this later, um, because I realize that you may not have seen our, our previous videos, but it may seem like we're making a leap from flesh to sinful nature um, to that being crucified. Um, but it, it actually isn't that much of a leap. Um, because the word that's translated as flesh, like Grace just talked about, um, sometimes it means the body, which is neutral, but other times it's, it's referring to those, to the, the, the outflow of the sinful nature and all those things. Um, but Paul specifically says that our old self, that old version of us, was crucified with Christ. So, so that this very thing was crucified was killed well so obviously a, very much a, can't be talking about our physical bodies have been crucified with christ because my physical body was never crucified right i'm very much right. so right and if and if flesh always is evil then it makes no sense to say that jesus was the word made flesh right, right? <laughs> so we, we have to know we have to we have to look at the context cues so clearly in this case in this case oh. in romans 8 5 the it's the, this flesh in the negative sense, it's flesh in the negative sense, right? So, okay, so we've identified that it's kind of this sinful nature, sinful desires aspect of, of human life. Um, okay, so before I ask my second question, can someone turn to Galatians 5? I was literally Galatians. just turning there, Skylar. <laughs> nice. nice. Literally, I'm in it right now. <laughs> okay, great. Great. So, you know, I asked the broad question, well, what is the flesh? And we kind of, we sort of honed in a little bit on some definition aspect of it. But Paul does, Paul does us a great favor here in Galatians 5 because he, because he gives a bunch of examples. Like, well, these are the things of 5, the flesh. 19. Yeah, exactly. If you could read 5, um, 19 through... 21. 19? 19, yes, thank you. Right, you don't even need me to ask you. Go for it. Can we just take over, Skylar, from here? <laughs> sure, why not? You have the controls. <laughs> uh, Galatians 5, 19, 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious. And think in your mind, which flesh are they talking about? Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness orgies and the like i warn you as i did before that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of god brilliant brilliant so there's some examples 
Obviously, you know, is that all inclusive? Probably not, but it gives enough things that we get a pretty good idea. Like, okay, this is the realm of the flesh. Rage, you know, uh, arguing with people, immorality, impurity, you know, witchcraft, all these types of things. But they should seem pretty obvious. You know, no, I don't think not any of those are particularly surprising. Um, but there it is. The flesh produces those things. So, next question. Back to verse five. In Romans what is Paul, in Romans eight, yes. What does Paul identify as the key difference between living according to the flesh versus according to the spirit? I'm wondering if anyone's ever going to raise their hands here. <laughs> Lisa. I mean, hey, sorry, Lisa, do you say verse five? Yes. Romans I 8, 5. I mean, it looks like he's making a distinction between, uh, you know, the, 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 those those who are living living in the flesh have that focus to want to uh, to do those things on, on that list that you guys read out. It's it's a matter of focus. I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Fo focus, focus. That's a great word. Um, what's the word? What, what does the word have in um, in uh, in your translation, Lisa? Minds. Minds. Yeah, those who live according to the sinful nature have their minds set on what that nature desires. Isn't that interesting? <clears throat> well, this is directly related to Romans 12 too. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, we were getting there. It was on my outline. Thank you for fe feeling Wait, my sorry. thunder. I'm sorry. <laughs> Literally what I was talking no, when, about when you asked your question, what do you do when you sin? I was like, well, I asked myself, what lies am I believing in my mind? I know. <gasps> I know. Sorry. Declan, go ahead. I'm not good at having someone else lead this, apparently. <laughs> um, wait, th those who live with work have their minds set. See, again, in old times, and, and, you know, and now a little bit, I, I, I would use this passage to say to myself, my mind is set on a fleshly desire. Therefore, um, I'm one of those, you know, who will live. Do you know what I mean? Uh, right, I, right. I would, I would use it to put myself in the in in, in the unfavorable category, if, if that right. makes sense. You know, it does. Mind you, mind you, uh, just to, it's just worth noting though. Is there's a lot of things in Galatians Galatians five that I don't do. I mean, I ought to pat myself on the back. I mean, yeah, there's one or two there that I, I'm, no, but I haven't done witchcraft and jealousy and self. I don't do all that. I mean, it's, uh, sometimes I feel like the worst person who walked the earth. There's one or two there I do, but there's a whole list. I don't do any of them. Anyway, go on. <laughs> um, I want to respond to something you said, and then jo uh, Johanna, I want to hear from you. I saw you try to raise your hand a couple of times. Um, uh, Declan, The word, and I've, I've talked about this actually with, with Teresa and with some other people as well. The word can condemn you if you read it the wrong way. Oh, yeah. It can condemn yeah. you if you read it the wrong way. So yeah. it's very, this is why we have to read the Bible from a um, uh, Christocentric perspective, from a, a, a cross centered perspective mindset um because if you read it from a from a from a legalistic mindset from a from a just like well am i behaving right or wrong in this particular moment mindset you'll find something to feel terrible about so so instead of saying oh my gosh i am i'm thinking this way um that means i must not be saved no it's inst instead flip it on its head and say well wait a minute because i am saved that means that i am empowered to think differently starting right now. Thank you, Father, that you've given me a new mind, that you've given me a new heart, and that you're actually leading me right now on paths of righteousness. And you can change, you can just change the whole game and flip it upside down on its head. Yeah, that's beautiful, beautiful, yeah. Um, Johanna, over to you. Um, I just wanted to share a quick thought that I had that relates to this line actually the other day, because um, I was thinking about like, 
all these feelings that we have as humans, like for example, sadness or jealousy or whatever, like all these negative feelings. And I came to the realization that all these feelings are human while God is love. Like God is just love. And whenever we, so like, for example, when we have our desires like set on human things, like we're talking about, this is some stuff that we experience, but when we set our mind on the spirit and on God, we act out of love because God is love. And that is so much greater than, than all the other things, you know, and that's just what I wanted to say. <laughs> yeah. Amen. Yeah. That's, that's good, Johanna. Thank you. Welcome, Max. It's good to see you again. It's been a few weeks. Quick question about what you just said, Joanna. Um, not directly to you, but just to the group in general. You said, Joanna, that there are more human emotions. And I definitely get that, but also at the same time, I kind of wonder if God has his own variation of those, if that makes sense. Um, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at this. Uh, then I've, I've, I've actually talked about this topic with a few folks recently. So emotions, it's very important for us to remember back in Genesis, Genesis one, right? God saw everything that he made and it was very good. Very good. There's a lot of emotions that we've all grappled with that do not even remotely fit in the very good category right? Depression, Pressure. sadness, rage, you know, um, jealousy, envy of some of those things on the, on the flesh list, right? So that begs the question then, well, wait a minute, if those aren't very good and everything that God made was very good, then where did they come from? The right? I, yeah, obviously they, they, they came from the fall. They came, they came from, uh, from our decision to turn away from God uh, when sin entered the world. So, but, so, but that then this all loops back together to this Christocentric perspective on the gospel and identity in Christ and all this. It's like, okay, if those things weren't part of the original design of God for us made in his image, but now they're in my experience, but now Jesus has set me free from the tree, if you will, the tree of, 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 of sin, like the bad tree that I was He's freed me from that. He's grafted me back into him. He's the vine. We're the branches. I'm a new creation. If I'm freed from sin, then that means I actually get to be free from those negative things as well. And I realize that's a big statement. I realize a lot of people are going to hear me say that. They're going to be like, oh, that's crazy. You're saying that I get to be free from anger and sadness and depression. And, and you have to hear this correctly. I'm not saying that you'll never feel that. I'm not saying that you won't bump up into them as you go through life, but I'm saying that you don't have to be enslaved by them. They don't have to own you. They don't have to be normal things that you always wrestle with. They can be not things that you slavery. actually. Yeah, exactly. They, you can find victory quickly over these things because you identify them as not who you really are. Well, this highlights exactly what I was saying in the beginning, like how I was struggling with feeling offended and triggered all the time. And I was trying to like, will myself to feel differently and I was like trying to like okay grace feel different and like I, I was fighting myself remember and then like I realized like God revealed to me is like these these thoughts aren't coming from you like the temptation to be offended is no different than the temptation to look at someone lustfully or the temptation to whatever like right so like I was like oh so you're saying like these emotions aren't mine which is why I don't want them and I'm annoyed that I have them right so like God, um, God made our emotions. And if he said everything was very good, obviously he didn't make bad emotions. Like he made good emotions. So like, if I'm a new creation, like those bad emotions aren't mine. Right. But like, we get confused when we think they out, they are ours and we start like claiming them and identifying with them. Right. And that's why we need to be renewed in our minds. And like earlier this year, or well, not this year, 2020, it feels like whatever. Earlier in 2020, I was taking antidepressants, like medication, right? And like, and as my mind kept getting renewed and I realized like, I'm a new creation, 
my old sinful nature has died and being depressed is part of sin, right? So like that part of me has died. Like that's not coming from me anymore. That's just a temptation from the devil to feel that way. Like I realized that and like it set me free from that feeling and I'm not taking antidepressants anymore. Like, do I get sad sometimes still? Yes, but like, it's not like, I'm not in bondage to it. It's not like controlling me like my master. Like, yes, I'll have, I have a, a spectrum of emotions still, but it's like, you're not in bondage and slavery to it because you've been set free. Wait, uh, what are you guys talking about? Sorry. Hi, Max, we're in Romans 8. Not yet. <laughs> that's awesome, Gracie. Thank you so much for uh, for sharing that. That's really powerful. I mean, that's a, that's a, that's a huge thing to, to like, be on medicine and then not be on medicine and be and be okay. That's really big. Um, so um, praise God for that. A um, next question. This is a doozy. Um, this is a doozy, and I realized that this is like this. This is a this is a theological Pandora's box. But I but I but there's. There's a truth here. There's a core truth that we have to get, we have to see, and we have to get to the bottom of this. So, um, we ha and we have to read this in the context of everything else, in the context of there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ, in the context of walking in the spirit and not in the flesh. We have, we have to see all of this. All that being said, here's my question. Can you walk with Jesus if your mind is set on the things of the flesh. If you are thinking about the things listed in Galatians 5 that we read, can you walk with Jesus? If that's where your mind is. Can you define walk with Jesus? Great question. Great question. Yeah. Walk with Jesus. Uh, follow him live a life that honors him and is representative of Christianity. Be a, be a genuine Christian. There's a lot of different ways we can phrase that. And that's why I use the word walk with Jesus, because I could also have said, can you be a Christian and think about those things and set your mind on those things? But then that begs the question, well, what does it mean to be a Christian? And we throw that word around it's a label, right? Oh, I'm a Christian. Well, I'm a Christian. Well, I go to church. And it's like, okay, let's try to, let's try to scale this down to something more specific, like practically live a life that represents authentic Christianity, following Jesus, walking with him where he's going, doing what he's doing. And there's nuances here. I realize um, this may I not be an easy answer. To this? Yeah, go for it. Um, so to what you just said i believe that for example having these thoughts is human which doesn't mean that it's like good or bad or whatever it's neutral um and i don't think that in order to be like a good christian or walk with jesus you're not allowed to have bad thoughts because they come naturally but i think in order to actually walk with jesus and be a good christian it's important to be aware that you have these thoughts but not act them out I guess. That's really good. That's really good, Johanna. You have a point, Lisa? So your question again is, can you walk with Jesus, but have your mind set on the sinful uh, on, on the things of the flesh. On the things of the flesh. I would think no. I mean, we can have, we can, to, to, have our, to have our mind uh, focused on set on living in i mean it's a difference between having a uh sinful temptation or or we make a choice but if our mind is completely set on that means we're following something else other than christ <coughs> yeah. yeah yeah that's good lisa i was gonna highlight something johanna said absolutely johanna having a thought is not sinful, right? Like I can have a thought, oh, hey, you should go sleep with Billy Bob and the nice jeans next door, right? And like we've discussed every week now that feeling a temptation or having a thought is not a sin, 
right? Jesus was tempted, right? And Jesus was without sin. So it's not sinful to have a temptation to have a thought, right? So there's a difference between thinking something and having like your heart and your mind set on something, right? There's a difference between me thinking like, oh, wow, you know, Billy Bob is really hot and like having that, that thought versus like start planning in my, in my heart. Like I'm going to like find a way to text him so I can get close to him to like, we can get, you know, maybe go out to get like, you know, like planning and like scheming in my heart. And like, I would do it if I had the chance, like there's a difference between like being attracted to someone being like, no, I would never do that versus like, yeah, like I, I'd tap that, you know, people say that like, it's, it's like, what is your heart and mind set on? Right. And if we look at first John, First John 1 verse 6, it says, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, Amen. we lie and we do not live out the truth. So this is Talisa. Yes. Like what you said is true. Like, no, we can't speak one way and have our entire lives look differently. Like you can call yourself a Christian. And I mean, like you can say anything I can say, I'm a pink pig, you know, but like, and that's, don't get me started on like this whole, like, how do you identify thing in the society now? Like I can say I'm a 12 year old boy and people have to accept that. I'm like, no, like you don't get to just call yourself whatever you want and like your life not reflect that, right? Cause that's just, you're just lying to yourself, right? If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and we do not live out the truth, right? So can you like in your heart want to do all this stuff that we mentioned and be like, well, I'm a Christian because I go to church on Sunday. Like, you're just lying to yourself. <laughs> so, right. So, and then, and we have to, we have to, again, as we're talking about all of this, we have to, we have to see this through the lens of the cross. We have to see it through the lens of no condemnation. We have to see it through the lens of identity. And we have to, we have to see the nuance between a temptation that is discerned and resisted and a mind that is set. Paul uses this language very specifically, the mind that is set on the things of the flesh. Like there's an emphasis, Declan used the word focus earlier. You're focused. It's not like a passing thought here and there, but it's like, I really want that. I'm looking at that. I'm focused on that. And I'm going after that. Right. And like Lisa said, you can't, you, you can't do that and follow Jesus, right? Because Jesus isn't going that way. You're, you're literally walking away from him. Um, and, and Paul makes it abundantly clear, you know, if, if anyone's unconvinced from this, from what we've all said here in verse seven, the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God. Hostile, not just doesn't care, um, isn't interested, but literally hostile, warring against, fighting against God. I mean, that's strong language. It's not just like I theoretically reject Jesus, but it's like I'm actually like coming to blows with him when my mind is set on the things of the flesh. I want to just real quick highlight the difference between like thoughts that you have and like having your mind set on something. Because I feel like if we don't, do. like it can open the door to condemnation. Like Declan, yeah, I know some, Declan, I know that you've expressed sometimes like when you're walking down the street, whatever, like oh a lady wearing minimal clothing walks by and like it, you know, grabs your attention, right? Like seeing, like if you're a man or even like, I'm talking mostly to men because men are more visual, M men are wired that way. Like women can have this response too, but I'm specifically talking to men just because they're wired to be visual, right? If you're a man and a, a naked woman runs past you and you get aroused, I mean, that's not sinful, right? Like that's, like you were wired that way. Like that's part of your biology. Like your flesh, remember like your body is not sinful, right? Now the, that's one thing because you, you were minding your own business. You know, this happened, you weren't seeking it out. There's a difference between that and like you have like a daily addiction to porn. You come home and seek it out purposely and like purposely go to find that to, to arouse yourself every day. There's a difference between like you're living your life, you're not seeking this out and this happens and you like, you have a reaction and you're like, okay, no, I don't, I would never do that versus like, you're purposely seeking it out. And like, you're, you've made this decision. You're like willfully doing this. Like, does that make sense? Like, these are two different scenarios. Like, you know, yeah. Don't let yourself feel condemned that you have a thought or that you had a reaction. Cause it's like, well, no, like we're in a spiritual warfare, right? Like the devil is going to throw errors at you. 
That's what Ephesians 6 talks about. Like we're going to get tempted, but there's a difference between, between that and like going purposely to look for it, you know, like, and like being in a lifestyle of it. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when it, when it, happen, when it happens to me, it's not like I'm thinking, uh, or, you know, um, it's not like I'm warring against God and, and that I think I should be able to do it and I want to do it. This is what I want to do. When, when it happens with me, it's not in that category at all. Thank God. I mean, it, it, it's more the, uh, you know, I'm just minding my own business and she, you know, something like that, you know. Yeah. And this, this comes back to something that we've hit in previous weeks as well, which is the, the notion, the contrast between uh, committing a sin and making a practice of sinning. It's actually a very, very important distinction in scripture because John says that, that, you know, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. I mean, that's strong language, not just like is a Christian that's messing up but like is of the devil. Yikes. So, so clearly, clearly a Christian cannot make a practice of sinning, which implies deliberate, habitual. Yeah. Um, but on the other hand, a Christian absolutely can sin, you know, and so where's that line between, you know, committing a particular sin sometimes versus a practice? Um, it's somewhere in there. I think we shouldn't be trying to figure out how much can I do? So how much deliberate that's sin can I get away with? Lead, that's what we leave to God <laughs> and trust in his goodness and his ability to judge with discernment, right? Right, yeah, like, that's that's up to God. That's and I think glad if we, that God is God. Yes. And I think if we're trying to find exactly where that line is to figure out how much I can sin and still go to heaven, then we're asking the wrong question. We should be running in the opposite direction. We've already revealed right. what our heart really is if we're asking that. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but I wanted to, I want, I do want to follow this up with, with, uh, with, you know, there are warnings, there are warnings. And I, and I, I, we have to, we have to realize that there are people who will say, well, I was a Christian. Well, I did a bunch of good things. That, that won't be in heaven. Like this is a biblical fact. Jesus says in Matthew 7, 21 and 23. Not right, everyone men, who says, Lord, Lord. Yeah. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, right? They'll, they'll say, didn't, didn't we prophesy in your name and do many mighty works in your name and cast out demons in your name and he'll say depart from me workers of iniquity i never knew you so um and, and paul 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 gives several warnings you know those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of heaven so we'll see if so, it's not about works it's not about works right so like just because you're doing good works doesn't mean you're doing it with the right heart so if you're just doing yeah. good things to get like attention and like people to look at you like, oh, wow, they're such a good person. You can do the right thing for the wrong reason. And if it's not about right. works, it's not about work. So God doesn't care like all the good deeds that you're doing. If your heart is still steeped in like sinful motives, it doesn't matter. Right. right. So I mentioned that because that's the, those, those warnings are the, uh, they're the they're the safety the safety rail the barrier if you will against going into the opposite ditch. We've talked a little bit about the legalism ditch and how this there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That's the safety safety barrier against against the the, the legalism thing, right? But the warnings that I'm giving here are that or that Paul gives and Jesus gives. They're the safety barrier against the false grace, against this notion that like well just God loves you and it's fine and you're going to heaven no matter what. And he's saying actually guys. Like you might not be if you just think you can do whatever you want, right? And, and these are the say, barriers well, I, that keep you free. Yeah, these are the barriers that keep you free. Realizing like, hey, Jesus set me free. It was his work. He gets all the credit and I just get to be free. But that doesn't mean that how I live is irrelevant. How I live is actually tremendously relevant because it reflects what I believe and who I am. Like we live out of the truth of what we believe about ourselves. So um, I mentioned those warnings, not to make anyone question their salvation, not to make anyone wonder, oh my gosh, am I really saved or am I, am I into condemnation? No, not at all. But I mentioned that to just to really um, put the kibosh on any possibility of, of false grace creeping in where we start to think it's a, well, okay, I can just do whatever because God loves me. 
wait, 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 wait. So you're saying that these barriers to keep us out of the ditches, it's almost like the straight and narrow path. Almost like that, yeah. <laughs> almost like that. So, so to recap, to make a practice, continual, focused, deliberate, setting my mind on the things of the flesh, going after them, you can't do that and follow Jesus. You can't. That is what the text says. That is being hostile to God. So um, don't be condemned by that. Don't be afraid about that verse. But realize that what we do with our minds is really, really important. And we have self-control. Yeah, go ahead, Gracie. And if you're worried about the state of your heart and like wondering if you've fallen too far into that ditch, chances are your heart is good and that you don't want to be doing those things. So you're probably okay. <laughs> this is more towards people that are like, oh, it's fine, but you know, like they don't care. Right, right. So like there's a there's a verse actually, and uh, I don't remember where it is. And it says, even if your heart condemns you, God is greater than your hearts. Right. So like when if you're one of those people that's worried, like, well, have I gone too far? Like, am I like that indicates your heart is good. <laughs> right. So anyways, that's all. That's good. It's good, Gracie. Um, OK, so we've talked about the flesh, the mindset on the flesh, all this kind of stuff. Right. And guess what? Just some good news here, because Paul says in verse eight, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, right? And so maybe maybe you're fe feeling a little condemned. Maybe maybe there's a little bit of voice like, well, shoot, am I in the flesh? Like, am I hostile to God? If we're wondering these kinds of things, look at verse nine. Look at verse nine. So great. What does it say? You, however, are not in the flesh, you're not in the flesh. This is one of those identity verses I mentioned. Let's keep our eyes open for identity verses. You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Boom. Boom. You're not in the flesh. You're not in the flesh. So that's something are, that you can are remind. We, are we in the flesh, though? <laughs> that's something you can remind yourselves of. When you, when you, maybe you're te there's a temptation or a thought that comes along, right? May and maybe, may oftentimes, and Declan, you've experienced this, Gracie, you have, I've experienced this, probably, probably all have. It's very often for a temptation and, and condemnation. It's like the one, two thing. Be tempted and then condemnation. And it's like, yeah, it's like, ooh, look at that hot woman. And then it's like, look at you looking at that hot woman. You're, you're, you're lusting, you're sinning, right? You're, maybe you aren't even saved. Like it, it all just, it's like this avalanche that hits you all at once. And we, we have to have an antidote to that. And the antidote is, okay, those aren't my thoughts. I'm not in the flesh. It's like what Chris, I, I can't remember if it's Chris Vallotton or Bill Johnson who says, the devil will give you his thoughts and then accuse you for has, having them. And I'm like, that was like, I was like, oh, wow. Yeah, he does do that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Amen. So, in light of all this, do we have a choice? And if so, what exactly is the choice? You have a choice of why. I'm sorry, Max? Do you have a choice of why? Uh, with regard to the flesh, like what do you mean do we have a choice to be in it or do we have a choice to operate out of it or what can you flesh out your can you flesh out what you mean about being in the flesh <laughs> yeah that's yeah. what i was trying to figure out I don't know. yeah so i asked if we're in the flesh right no paul says we're not in the flesh but then he also talks about the mindset on the flesh the mindset on things of the spirit so do we have a choice and if so, what is the choice? Um, I feel like, like we talked about last week, like there's a difference between getting free and staying free, right? Like Moses set the Israelites free from Egypt, right? 
And a lot of them wanted to turn right around and go back because things got hard or whatever, right? And so like, we have a responsibility once we've been set free to, to keep ourselves free. Like God could heal me of an alcohol addiction, right? But if I'm like, oh, cool. And then just start drinking every day. Like I didn't do my part to stay free. So I, I feel like every week I talk about Romans 12 too, that we are, renew we are transformed by the renewing of our minds. So like, it's a choice slash responsibility that like we can be set free or we can be saved and have no idea what we've been saved from, right? Like we can be free, but have no idea what we're, what we're free from if we don't renew our minds, right? Like, like I'm an, like before, like I was an, I was a new creation born again. I just didn't know it. Right. And so like, I was living out of a mindset of the flesh because I didn't know that my flesh was dead. So like my mind wasn't renewed. So like I was saved, but I had, had no idea what I was saved from, if that makes sense. So like, I don't know if I like the word choice, but I feel like I like the word responsibility more. Like we have the responsibility to continue walking in the freedom that Jesus bought for us. And we have a responsibility to renew our minds. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. For sure. For sure. What I, what I was getting at with that question, which you basically went, went to, Gracie, is, is, is our thoughts. Our thoughts. Because it's important to note that, swinging back to verse 5 and 6, he doesn't say, he doesn't say those who live according to the flesh do fleshly actions. Right? Although, obviously, we know, because we looked at Galatians 5, we know what types of actions are associated with the flesh. But Paul's very specific that he, he's, he's looking at the mind. He's looking at what we think and what we believe, right? What's going on in here? So this is, where the, this is where the war is. This is where victory is. And this is where the choice is, right? I think it's a mistake to reduce things down to the, the choice to do a good behavior or a bad behavior, right? Because that, that's, that's far downstream. That's downstream of, of up here, right? Because if I'm... If I've set my mind on the things of the spirit, if I have, my mind is renewed, if I know who I am, if I'm settled and solid in my identity, I'm not even going to float down the river to the, to the point where I'm likely to make that type of a choice to walk in the flesh. So the, the real key is what do you believe? What do you actually believe? What do you believe about yourself, about who you are in Christ? About who so Christ you're is saying we're supposed to fight the good fight of faith? Yes, I am saying that. <laughs> wow, it's almost like I that's in the Bible or something. The most important choice is what you believe. So you're saying that the truth will set us free? Uh, that's the old thing. <laughs> Skylar, did you say the most important choice is what? What you believe. And what you, and it isn't it also, whoa, black screen, white screen. Whether you walk in concert with the spirit or not. I mean, I think that's the choice. You get the proddings and it's like, come hither, don't go thither. And Hither or thither is makes all the difference. Don't forget yawn, hither, thither, and yawn. Yeah, what about yawn? What happened to yawn? Hither, thither, and yawn. Let's not leave yawn out of this, Joe. Okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> hey. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Joe, um, yes, obviously, faith without works is dead, right? But I, I, I believe um, what we believe, actually, what we truly believe will manifest in our lives. Like, like, like I can say all I want. I'm not scared of the dark. Right. But if I always keep the lights on and I refuse to like walk down a dark hallway, my life is showing that I don't really believe that. Right. So like when I, when my life matches up with what I say, I believe that's when I know I believe it. Right. Like I can say, Oh, I trust God to provide for me. But then like every you know time the bills are due, I stress out and like completely lose my crap. And like, I'm always constantly anxious. That shows that I don't actually believe that, right? So like, yes, our, our, um, our works or our life matters, 
but it ultimately is a reflection of what we actually believe. So if we focus on our belief first, the works will naturally follow. What we get into trouble is when we focus on our works so much that we, we make it about works and performance, right? It's like the, the works are the fruit, right? We need to focus on the tree and the tree will naturally produce those fruits, right? You can't focus on apples and never focus on the tree. Like, right, like a tree, a healthy tree will just naturally produce good fruits. So. Hey, do you know, this is a really, really cool um, science factoid, Grace, that goes just along with that. Do you know how you make seedless fruit? You make seedless fruit by taking the, a branch from one type of tree and planting it into another. It, so it's making bad fruit. It's making fruit that cannot reproduce. Mm. So it is, and there's definitely some kind of um, spiritual implication here, but yeah, if you take an apple branch and stick it into a pineapple tree, you're going to get an apple that cannot reproduce seedless apple. Yeah, so yeah, no, this is sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say, You're like, fine. yes, obviously, works are important, works ultimately prove what we believe, but let's not focus on just our works and making sure we're doing everything because that's gonna turn into striving and performance, right? Like, focus on renewing your mind and the works will follow, right? Like, I tried for so long to like stop sinning and it never worked until I renewed my mind and fixed fixed what I believed. And then those things just naturally changed by themselves, you know? So the, the mis often the, the Satan's biggest like deception is just taking things that are true and just swapping the order, right? So like, yes, faith and works are important but he puts the emphasis on works first. He, like the law says, do this and you will live. Right. So the emphasis is on works first, whereas the spirit says live and you will do. Right. So it's focusing on your faith first and the works will follow. So the, the, often the devil's biggest deception is just swapping the order of, of you doing things. So anyway, that's that. You know, there's there's kind of another choice here uh, as well, at least for me. I, I, you know, I don't. But um, how can I explain this? So, you know, my whole life, I, I was, uh, you know, I was okay with the idea of Jesus died on the cross. I, I knew this, uh, and I knew a lot of theology behind that. But what I didn't know, and what I, at some level, was a choice for me to accept, and I'm in the process of accepting it, is, is that not only he did those things, but he actually did them for me even although I've done some of those things on the list that you read from Galatians 5. Do, 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 does that make sense? And I, I, I sometimes need to exercise some choice and volition in, in, in believing that and accepting it. Ex not just as an idea, as a notion, but, but as a reality for me. Accepting that someone did that, that for me, you know. I don't know if that makes sense to you. That's brilliant, Declan. That, and that's huge. Like it might sound, that might sound kind of like, okay, cool, whatever to, to some of us, but that's incredibly powerful. Like to recognize that Jesus didn't just die in some sort of general sense for the world, which he did, right? But to make it personal, like, no, he died for me, like my junk, my worst mistakes. And that's and, like, whoa. That's yeah. And, and, and for me to, to choose to accept it, you know? Yeah. Love it. Love it, Declan. That's really good. I wanted to respond. Uh, Lisa posted something on the, in the chat. She said, I was trapped in the, in the mindset of being enslaved to the accusers of the accusations. And I, a verse came to mind. This is not related to Romans, but I just wanted to quickly go there because uh, it's, a, it's an incredibly powerful verse it's in Revelations 12. Um, and it, it kind of addresses the issue of, of accusations. Um, um, and so it says, now the salvation and the power, and this is Revelation 12, 10. Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brothers has been thrown down who accuses them day and night before our God. Talking about the devil, obviously. Now here's the, here's the amazing part. It says, and they have conquered him. 
It lists three things. They have conquered him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they loved not their lives even unto death. That's really, really powerful there because it I shows us three. Go ahead. Oh. Sorry, no, I, I love that. Can you just say where it was again? Revelations 12, 10. Okay, 10 thank 11. you. 10, 10, 10, 10, 12, 10, and 11. Um, chapter 12, verses 10 and 11. Uh, so the devil's accusing, 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 and then the believers overcome him because of the blood of Jesus. In other words, the finished work of the cross, what Jesus has done, his work, not ours. The word of their testimony, meaning speaking and declaring, in essence, what God has done for me, what Jesus has done for me personally, to me, in me, through me, in my life practically, set me free from X, Y, and Z. Um, and finally, loving not your own life even unto death, meaning it's not about me. It's not about me and my own kingdom and building my empire of awesomeness about me. It's about Jesus, right? And, and to live as Christ, to die as gain. So like in that place, no, there's, it's impenetrable from accusation. The devil has no access point when we're in that place. So anyway, I just wanted to hit that because it's really beautiful. Um, all right, back to Romans. By the way, if anyone has any thoughts at any point, please feel free to interject. Yes, Scholar, that really changed my life. And Grace really had spoken into me about that because I would like wake up in the morning and I'd have like the, the accuser would just start right in. And until I really realized that because of Jesus dying for me, I had authority over that. And that it's and what you were saying earlier, it's what we believe. And before I believed that I was just... Um, randomly attacked by satan and that's just the way it was and i would just have to ride through the storm and so for example when i was driving back to boise on wednesday i started getting a little sad and before i would have like gone downhill right into this mindset and i'm like no and i just started declaring who jesus was and um that that's not me I am not a sad person. I am joyful uh, because the Lord says that's who I am. And Almost like one of the fruits of the spirit is joy or something. <laughs> and that girl wears a yellow dress. Oh, sorry. No, I just watched um, this video by Chris Vallison yesterday. Um, and he said something that was really powerful. He said, um, Spiritual warfare is normal in the life of a Christian, but oppression is not, right? And people can blur the lines there and get confused. It's like, obviously, you know, we're in a war. We're going to like go through <clears throat> spiritual warfare sometimes, right? And if you're not, that's probably a bad sign because if you're not, the devil's not attacking you ever. It's probably because you're not doing anything worth attacking, right? He's like, if if the devil's not like angry at you and trying to stop you, it's probably because you're not doing anything worth stopping, right? So like spiritual warfare is normal, right? Oppression is not. And the difference is that like spiritual warfare lasts for like a season, whereas oppression is like a lifestyle, right? <laughs> and, you know, that's kind of a helpful distinction between like the stumbling in sin and like living willfully as a practice in sin right? There's a difference. Now, when does spiritual warfare turn into oppression? I don't know. I'm not going to give like exactly 17.3 days. Like after that, it's like, I don't know, you know, but like, there's a difference between like you being constantly oppressed and like devil, like attacking you and you just kind of taking it. Cause you think that this is just how it is. Like Lisa, like you said, like you don't realize you have authority to cast it out and tell him to knock it off. Like literally Satan, get the hell out of here, you know? Um, so just to highlight that difference, um, yeah, was really powerful to me. It's interesting to mention that, Gracie, because you know, just recently after, yeah, in the last two months after Marilyn and I have been married, I've been 
I've been experimenting with that a little bit more when something happens and she's not feeling good or whatever, really sad about something. I'll, I usually start praying. And during that prayer, I usually tell things, leave. We don't want you here. You don't have space here. It's not your place. We choose God's presence. So leave. Take all of your angels with you and get out of here. And God, come in here and put your Holy Spirit here instead. And that usually really helps a lot. Yeah. That, uh, that's awesome. And that's amazing. That's, that's fantastic. I'm really proud of you for praying that way. Because a lot of times, actually, Gracie and I were just talking about this a couple of days ago, about different types of prayer. This is a whole, whole another conversation, another Bible study for another day, but like a quick one minute thing about it. You know, there's a biblical precedent for petitionary prayer where we're asking God for something. There's also a, there's also a, a absolutely a biblical precedent for what you just described, Ben, for, for things that we might call prayer today, but they don't, they don't really tend to refer to them as prayers in the Bible. They're more like declarations, declarations, you know? Lazarus come out or stretch forth your hand or pick up your mat and walk or, you know, just commanding a demon, like come out of him. Um, and so like, that's Ben, you're, you're, you're spot on. Like there absolutely is a place to recognize, like there's something going on here that doesn't belong. Right. And I, and I am a son of God. I have the authority of Christ and I'm going to tell it to leave and it has to listen to me. So the, amazing. The other thing just since we're on this topic, we might as well just continue for a second, um, is recognizing that the devil has power, but he has no authority. And what the difference of, of that is, no, like, uh, if you look at a policeman, his power is his gun, right? He's got power. His authority is his badge, right? Or he's been, like, given authority by, you know, a governing officials, whatever. The devil has power, obviously, right? Like, he can inflict things. He can you know, whatever, he can harass you, but he has no authority. He has no badge, right? All authority in heaven has been won by Jesus and has been given to us. So we have authority over, over the devil, but oftentimes we just don't realize it, right? Like the only people, the only person that sometimes doesn't realize our authority is us. Like God knows our authority. The devil knows our authority, but we don't know our own authority. So, um, yeah, just sometimes like having faith in the authority that you have and the power that God's given you and uh, directly addressing the, the dark forces and being like, hey, like, get out, like, is what does it, you know, rather than just like trying to run and hide from the devil and like, you know, kind of like running away from the bully and not realizing you can stand up to him. So, yeah. Now that we've officially moved way past where we were talking about, you may bring, it, bring us back in, Skylar. Thank you for <laughs> your permission. <laughs> All authority um, has been given unto you by me. <laughs> uh -huh. Wow. Um, okay, now that we can move on from heresy. Um, <laughs> uh, all right, so we're gonna move ahead a little bit. There's, there's some good stuff to unpack in like verse 9, 10, and 11, but, but I want to focus on some things in like 12 to 17. So, so we're gonna just, we're gonna skim ahead a little bit because we've, we've covered some amazing stuff, but I don't want to keep everyone here all day. So in verse 12, Paul says, we are debtors, or some, some translations say under obligation. We're under obligation. And we don't like wow. that word. Um, we don't tend to like that word in, in, in modern English, like, well, well, I'm obligated. It has sort of this, this icky feeling, like, well, I have to do it, right? Um, so what does he mean there? He says, we're not debtors, we're not under obligation to the flesh, Um but we are ob under obligation to something. We're, on, we're debtors to something. So what's what's he talking about there? Sorry, what verse are we in? 12. Uh, I feel like this is just talking about what we were talking about before, like that in Romans 6, that we're not slaves to sin, that we're slaves to righteousness, because that slave and obligation thing kind of like has the same kind of idea. And I said like last time that like, when I was a slave to sin, I couldn't stop even if I wanted to. Like I tried so hard to stop doing things I didn't want to do, but I couldn't because I was a slave to sin, right? So like, 
when you're a slave to something, you don't have a choice. Like you can't help but do it. So when now when you're a slave to righteousness, guess what? You can't help but be righteous, right? So like you just you just do it naturally. Like you can't help but do it, right? So like I feel like that's what he's saying. Like we have an obligation not to the flesh because we've been set free from that slaveryhood, slave slave slaveness, <laughs> slaverosity. <laughs> Um, but we have uh our life is to live according to the to the to the spirit right because we are slaves to righteousness in the sense that we can't help but be righteous so that's what i take from it yeah yeah i i think that's spot on chrissy that was that was a note that i had was was linking back to romans 6 um sometimes words words like debtor or obligation we're kind of, we kind of are like oh, i don't really know what that means so we just sort of keep reading but but yeah this this theme of slave to sin slave to righteousness is slave central is, cent is central uh to, to, to paul's paul's writings here so um okay let's look at verse 13 the next verse he says if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. And what I want to look at is the, the phrase by the spirit. If by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Why is that, why is that phrase there? And why does it matter? By the spirit. Why doesn't Paul just say, if you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live? Well, I guess it's implying that we actually need the spirit to be able to do that. You see what I'm saying? So it's not about your own works, was what you're saying, Declan? Well, I'm saying I, I can, I, me sitting around here trying to put my own misdeeds, to, it, 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 that's not working out. I need the spirit to, to, you know, I need to draw on the resources of the spirit. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. It's the difference between his strength and my strength. You know, I mean, uh, self-righteousness is toxic and it does not lead to the cross. So, um, that's, I mean, that's, I mean, also some sins just so overwhelming. That it, it, I mean, take the instance of the woman walking by and you get it. I mean, that's out of my hands. I mean, I need the spirit for that. I can't, it's then, not so easy just to sit there and say, oh, I'm going to cut this off and not do that anymore. No, right. that, 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 I, I, I need, um, no, I need that yeah. supernatural help, you know? Then, just realize that, like, the fact that it's done by the spirit, like, removes all, it, it removes any excuse, really. It removes the ability for people to boast and be like, oh, look how great I am. Like the self-righteousness because they didn't do it. It was by the spirit. It also <laughs> takes away the excuse of like, oh, well, I'm a, I'm a, you know, simple human. I can't, I'm not powerful enough. I'm not strong enough. Like, like, well, it's not about you anyways. It's about the spirit. So like it eliminates self-righteous thinking and also like eliminates defeatist, like sin, sinful mentality thinking also. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah, very well said, Gracie. I love that. Just came um, Awesome. Awesome, awesome. Yeah, because if we walk, if, 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 if it's his righteousness, I know we didn't start with Romans 5. We started with Romans 6. Romans 5 is amazing too. In Romans 5, Paul talks about the free gift of righteousness. So it can't possibly be self-righteousness if it was a gift that I received. It didn't come from me. It came from him. And I didn't do anything to earn it. So anyway, he gets all the credit for it. It's, it's amazing. Um, next verse. Here's, this is, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to try to slay a very, very popular sacred cow in universalism and new age right here. Okay. okay. Here we go. Okay. Is it biblical to say that everyone is a child of God. Yes and no. 
know, no, you know, it's a, it, it's a good question. Um, so it's a, that's a very good question, actually. You know. Yes, we're Tracy, all. Would God's you like to children. elaborate? Yes, we're all God's children in the sense that, like, he's he literally created us. You know, and like we all are alive because he created humans, you know, and he died for all of us. So like it's ex the invitation is extended to everyone. No, in the sense that like not everyone is saved, right? Like you have to like agree to be adopted into his family, right? Like God's not like abducting you and throwing you in his trunk and taking you to his house to force you to be his children, right? Like he's offering and you have to accept it <laughs> like right so like some people say no so like yes and also no <laughs> if that yeah, i see it I, I i see it the same way I, I that that's very well said actually so the, the 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 um the position of being an heir is offered to us but not everyone takes up that offer in fact some people actively re reject it which i think which I think has to put them on a different footing, you know? Yeah, yeah. And this, this brings up the, the, a, a key, a central question, which is that the way that we minister I'm to sorry, or speak to or encourage um, a believer who is maybe struggling in a particular area is significantly different than how we minister or speak to a non-believer who is approaching this with their own external questions, biases, preconceptions, etc., cetera. Um, because it's equally harmful or it's harmful in both cases to tell a believer that they're a terrible rotten sinner, you know, in other words, undermining the notion of the fact that they have been set free by the blood of Jesus, that they have received the free gift of righteousness, that they are a new creation. It's equally harmful to sort of steer them away from that as it is to tell someone that hasn't actually received Christ in the first place that they're already a child of God because that, that can make it sound like everything is fine, let's all just hug and sing kumbaya and you don't even really need Jesus in the first place. So we have to be, be careful about our audience here, um, and the, the child of God is is a very popular expression to be to use to make people feel good about themselves. Um, but biblically, we have to we have to say, well, what does the text say? And, and the text says some interesting things. You know, in Ephesians two and five, Paul refers to unbelievers as sons of disobedience. Uh, in, in John 8, Pharis uh, Jesus talking to the Pharisees, he tells them that they, you are of your father, the devil. Um, you know, he doesn't say, oh, you guys are all, we're all children of God. No, he says, you're of your father, the devil. So, um, like, if we're going to be faithful to the text of scripture, let's be faithful to the text of scripture. And then right here, it says in, in Romans 8, 14, all who are led by the spirit are sons of God. And by the way, ladies, the word sons, imply, it's a broad term implying humans. People, hey, it's right? 2021. So, I can be a son. <laughs> you can. You can. That's true. Um, so so that there's, a, there's, a, there's a clear implication that, that sonship, Declan, like you said, like the invitation is available free invitation to be an heir um but it isn't it isn't it isn't taken by everyone it's offered to everyone but it's not taken by everyone so yeah yeah you may, you know it, it's actually a very good point you're making see with with the new age movement they do say that a lot if you're a child now i, I mean i'm not one who I'm not one that normally likes any kind of elitism or making divisions or anything like that, or that we're elect and then I, I'm not trying to get into all that, but just it, it, it there has to, to be some distinction between, you know, these two types of people. If someone's actively rejecting, uh, you know, you know, the gospel uh, versus, uh, you know, are they, I mean, 
potentially they're a child of God, but in that state, they're, they're not on the same footing as us who are trying our best to, you know, understand and grapple with these things. Do you know what I mean? But, but also, when it, see, when it comes to the New Age movement, some of that's intentional. It, it, yeah, it's very well something. thought out. You know? Right, it, it is. And, and that's the thing that a lot of, a lot of lies, a lot of, a lot of theological, spiritual lies, they feel really good. They sound good. They feel good. They have this warm, fuzzy, positive vibes type thing, and that's why New Age is very popular. Um, well, they, but it, yeah, it's very well thought out, very well yeah. researched, very well thought out. Yeah, May I that doesn't make it true. Them? Oh, Teresa wants to say something. Please do. Go ahead, Teresa. Sorry, but <laughs> um, it's just that when we were talking at the beginning when I had not fallen asleep. <laughs> we, were, uh, we were talking about like everybody, that we should not forget how everybody is really loved by, by God as, as dad, as you know, that he loves us, whether we sin or we don't, he loves us. So this is for me, I'm sorry, but this is for me quite a contradiction then because I believe that we are uh, indeed everybody uh, daughters and sons of God in the sense that whatever we do, he will always be our, our dad in this way. He will, he will not love anyone less because he decides not to go, uh, not to fall into his arms. We can decide to go wherever, you know, wherever we want and we can decide against him, but he will not love them less um, because of that so if we decide against his love and his truth um, I still believe we are his his children but then we will not uh, be home at his place anymore of course because how could we go into as you said he will not drag us into his home and force us to stay there right but <laughs> but Actually, I still believe he has created all of us, so he loves all of us, whether we, we decide to stay there or not. Isn't that Absolutely, the Teresa. You know, we're not saying God loves anyone any less, right? But like love in itself requires free choice. Like if God forced everyone to love him back, that wouldn't be love, right? So like he, he loves us all, but he gives us the opportunity to either choose to love him back or not. So there are just factually people that are going to choose not to, right? So he lets them go. And like, if they yeah. want, what's it called when, um, when a child wants to be separated from their parents? Um, uh, like Eman a, emancipated from yeah. their parents. Yeah. So like, in a sense, like God lets us do that with him. Like he lets us walk away from the family, like the, like the prodigal son, right? The, the father let the child leave right like he's not going you know the father right even if my if one of my boys would decide i mean that would break my heart definitely but you know that they do not want to have anything to do with me anymore i would still feel for the rest of my life that they are my boys of course yeah we're not saying that god doesn't love them or doesn't want to be their father but like he lets us choose you know so like if if someone says, I don't want God to be my father, he's like, okay, like, but he'll oh, always wow. be there if you change your mind, but like, he still lets you choose. Like, he's not like, I'm going to be your father, whether you, whether you like it or not, you know, like we get to choose which family we want to be in. Like, do we want to be under like sin or do we want to be under God's family? Like we get to make that decision. Like the invitation is always open on his end. But, like the prodigal son could have, like he came back, but he could have very well not. Right, and essentially he wouldn't have been his son anymore because he re he renounced his affiliation with his father. What about the Edomites, though? Sorry. What about the Edomites? The Edomites weren't sons of God. What are we? What What about the Edomites? Um, well, he specifically says that he hated Esau, and so um, the Edomites were the opposite of Israel. So I, that's why I, I don't believe that everybody is of God, especially like because uh, some Gentile, unless you're grafted in, then you're not a, you're not a child of God. It, 
You know, another thing is, uh, where, where, where's that line where it says, um, you, you know, you'll say my name and I'll, and I'll say I never knew you uh, talking about God. Matthew somewhere. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Is it, you, might, you might call on me, but I, I'll say I never knew you. Uh, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Matthew, it's Matthew 7, Matthew 7, 21 to, to 23. Okay. What, what, what I'm saying is I, I, I love the idea of talking about uh, God as, as God being loved. And if it's accurate, I love it. But I think God is more than a, more than a few things. So, because I, I, I struggled with this before, it's very helpful for me to look in Revelations, for example, and, and look at references of Jesus as being the Lion of Judah coming out on a horse with a flaming sword, all right? There, there, there are implications that um, that, that, that not everything is acceptable, that it's a free for all. Do you know what? Do you know what I mean? And and I and I need. I, I it's it, it's actually helpful for me to see it that way, because it's when it when it's all love this, love that, and everybody loves every, it. It um, it, it it just begins to be unhelpful for me personally. I I would say it with my understanding, it, if, if that makes any sense. It does for sure, Declan. And that's exactly why we try to continually emphasize like there's a boundary over here and there's a boundary over here. The, and the boundary, right. the, you know, the one boundary is, is what you've experienced and most of us have to one degree or another, you know, the <laughs> legalism boundary, the like, you're terrible, stop messing up, God is mad at you boundary, right? Which is obviously nonsense. The other boundary is, is, is the false grace, the cheap grace that like, well, God just loves everybody. So, no, so nothing really matters. Like, well, God loves you anyway. So however you behave, it's just whatever. Right. And it's like, God is absolutely loving. Like he, he is love. That is true. He is also just, he, he hates sin. He hates sin. Like that is biblical. That's not me being mean. That's not me overblowing his wrath. Like the wrath of God is a biblical concept. And if we're going to say we believe this book, then that's a thing. But he hates sin. Like his wrath is revealed against unrighteousness, right? And so, so we, that means that when, when we are become aware of things in our life or things in the lives of people that we care about, it's not time to condemn them and say, you're a bad person for doing this, but it's time to say like, hey, this is not good. Like this is it's time to turn away from this, to walk away from this. This is a harmful thing. God wants you to be free of this, and he's made a way for you to be free of it. Um, so we, uh, we, we have to see, see these things in the right way, you know? And so to, just to bring it back to this whole children of God thing, um, absolutely, every human is made in God's image, you know? And, 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 and every human has the potential, right, to be, to be an heir the kingdom, as, as, as Paul talks about here, co-heir with Christ. Um, it says that God showed his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, right? So God's love is displayed towards everyone. Everyone, his love is poured out over the earth towards everyone, but not everyone receives it, right? And for those of us who do receive it, there's a calling. There's a calling to, to walk in a way that honors the love that we have received, that honors the free gift that we've received. Not because like God's going to schwack us with a lightning bolt if we don't, right? But because it, we've been commissioned. We've been commissioned. It's like putting on armor, like as an officer in, in, in the armed forces, in the military, like it comes with responsibility. It comes with, with, with honor and, and, and obligations, like we talked about, to righteousness. So um, it does matter how we live. It does matter. Because it impacts the people around us. People can either be turned off to the God we say we follow, or they may see the way we're living and say, man, what's with you? Why are you so filled with hope and joy and warmth and just blessing the people around you? Like, I want some of what you have, you know? So, um, yeah, how we live really matters. It really matters. All right. Final question. Final question. Um, verse 17. It says, we're heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him. Hmm. Hmm. What does that mean? To suffer 
with him, to suffer with Christ. Sounds like- Wait a minute, I thought being Christian was about, huh? Go ahead. I was gonna, no, I just said, I thought being a Christian was, was about prosperity, was about getting my new car and my, my new jet and my huge mansion and my bank account having a billion dollars in it. Don't get me started on that prosperity gospel crap. Yeah, yeah, no, that, that, that really pisses me off. Yeah. Um, sharing in his suffering sounds like, oh, you've been crucified with Christ. Okay. So there's there's a there's a reference there's a past past tense reference there perhaps to, to what has happened. How about ongoing? Is there is there an ongoing aspect of it? Well, uh, it says it says here. See, uh, uh, yes, we we've established his suffering, but what about my suffering? It, to me, this is implying that there's going to be yes, he suffered on the cross, right? But but but. The, this implies to me there's going to be some suffering for me to do as well in some way or fashion. Right, right. Yeah, and, and, and this is actually 100% biblically true. I mean, there, there are so many verses. Jesus, Jesus says, uh, in this life, you will face tribulations. You will. Um, it's that Paul says it's somewhere else that all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. You will. Not you might. You will. Right. So this notion that being a Christian means like everything is always great and peachy and everybody loves you and, and you have tons of money and, and like your life is amazing all the time. It just isn't biblical. Right now, there absolutely is a promise that God will provide for our needs. Right. There's a promise that he will be with us in everything that we ever go through. Right. We absolutely do have victory over the enemy, over sin, over over these these things that come against us. But this notion of like worldly prosperity that's nonsense. This notion of never having any challenges in life, that's nonsense, right? So that, so then that begs the question, suffering. Are there different types of suffering? Is that's there perhaps- going to be another Bible study. Cool. Well, then this will just be a quick primer. Um, I propose that there's, there's good suffering, if you will, and bad suffering. And what I mean by that is there's, kind of, there's a kind of suffering that we experience when we go through a, a trial, something that's hard, something that, that is difficult, painful, um, that maybe God led us through. Maybe he led us through a particular trial, a challenge, something to grow in. Um, there's also bad suffering, which is oppression, right? Which is the devil came to steal, kill, and destroy. And we need to recognize what those, what those different kinds of things are, right? Um, because suffering, that, that's, a, that's a trial in the sense of um, maybe uh, persecution because of our faith or a challenges with a difficult person in our workplace or in our family, right? Those things can be a trials. They can be, they can be suffering. They can be painful, right? The way we approach that is very different than you know, um, someone that I love is, a, is afflicted with a disease, right? Because that's, that's not from the Lord. And that's something that needs to be resisted, like with the authority of Christ, the way that like Ben talked about praying. So Gracie, you look like you have a thought. Yeah, I'm going to just say this real quick and then I need to get ready to go to work. Um, but when you said like the different types of suffering, I don't want to get too much into this. Um, because we're going to talk about suffering at a light, later time, but it's pain is unavoidable in life. Like in this world, we will have trouble, right? We live in a simple planet. Like we can't avoid bad stuff happening, right? But pain can either be with a purpose or without a purpose, right? There could be good pain or bad pain. Like when you go to the gym and work out, it's going to hurt. Like you're ripping muscles. Like it's you're going to be sore, right? But like you can rejoice in that suffering, right? Because you know, you're getting stronger. Like what's the verse that says that we rejoice in our suffering because we know it produces character and whatever else. So like, <laughs> that's an example of like good, good pain, right? Good suffering. Bad pain would be like, oh, I hooked up with this person and now I have herpes, right? Like that pain is not purposeful like that's not helping you get better like that was just pain without a purpose right like so oftentimes we can have pain in our lives because we made bad choices and that's when people blame god like why did you let this happen it's like well 
you went and hooked up with Billy Bob and now you have herpes that was on you. Like that wasn't God, right? Or we can have, sorry, I'm just using an example. Or like we can have good pain, like, you know, or put into like a trial where like we come out stronger on the other end. Like, so like there's different types of things we go through, right? And like having to understand like God's not behind inflicting your mom with cancer to teach you a lesson, right? Like that's not, God doesn't do that. But anyways, um, that's just my kind of two cents about that. I have to get ready to go to work. I know Skylar, you have to go too soon, but. Um, yeah, no, literally we're, we're, we're done. Yeah, I got, I got to go fly. <laughs> We're going to stop here at verse 17 and then we'll pick back up at 18 next week. Um, right. So love you. Love you guys. Thank you so much for your brilliant insights. Um, we will continue this tour de force through Romans eight. Um, we, Lisa, made it halfway. Like we made it halfway. We did. Lisa, would you like to close us in prayer? Absolutely. Oh, dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your word that is truth, Lord, and that there's freedom in your word, Lord, and that a renewing of our minds is, is really a simple thing that you've really done that for us, Lord Jesus. And I'm just so thankful for this group, Lord, and to have a place to be able to talk about these things and the things that aren't talked about in church, Lord. And I'm just so grateful for that. And I just pray that you bless everyone uh, this week and uh, we get to read more and learn more. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. 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 Awesome. Woo-hoo. Hey, thank you, Skylar, Gracie. Thank you. Yeah, Skylar, you killed Absolutely. it. Well, Jesus, Jesus killed it. Killed sin in the flesh. <laughs> Wait, we, we, we... <laughs> We should have we should have a meeting about a prosperity th- uh, theology. It really pisses me off. Yes, you know? really we will. Don't, don't worry. <laughs> I get so mad. Yeah. That's part of the the suffering talk. I'm writing it down right Declan, now. Declan, Declan, if you could if you could send me a thousand dollars a month, God will bless you so much, so much. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> but but you know what? But it's it, it and it and it's my fault for looking for these all this material i mean it just the whole thing just pisses me off so does it make you mad declan i'm not i'm not sure i understand <laughs> i think it kind I, of I, unclear I, it, this racy it's actually satan's finest work <laughs> really. uh, well i have to bounce guys literally on a trampoline because i'm gonna go teach gymnastics <laughs> so yes Okay. Um, are you leaving too, Sky? Love you guys. Yeah, I gotta go as well. Right. Okay, it was fly great safe. to see you, Declan. Great to see you, Lisa, and you, Katie, as well, and Christian. Goodbye. Okay. Have a good week, everybody. See you guys next Friday. See you later. Bye. Yep.